As you can imagine, we do a lot of conferences across the United States. Uh, we talk to a lot of people in a lot of places. That all of these issues have a common denominator among them. And that common denominator is that we seem not to be able to make any decisions at the local level that stick anymore. And in fact, those decisions about sustainability and about you know, protecting nature and about protecting our authority to democratically govern ourselves and our community to build sustainable communities at the local level, about what we think our vision should be as experts ourselves who live in the community, who have the most knowledge about how that community operates and what's best for that community. I'm not going to start talking about water tonight. I'm actually going to start talking about mining. In western Pennsylvania, one of our communities got sued about a month ago. And they, this is coal country in western Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody's spent a good bit of time there, but a lot of coal's been pulled out of the ground in western Pennsylvania. And with that pulling out of the ground in western Pennsylvania, it's come a lot of damage, uh, a lot of damage in those communities. Uh, you drive through them, you see the slag piles. There are three uh, elected officials uh, similar to your select boards. Uh, we have in Pennsylvania a township board of supervisors. They're our smallest unit of government. The supervisors in these small units of government in Pennsylvania were essentially hired, and in fact the office of township began as a way to take care of the roads. So these folks in the townships actually run the snow plows in the winter and they patch the roads in the summer, that's what they do, and they get paid about $3,700 a year to do it. Some folks in western Pennsylvania have gotten pretty upset with something that began about 10 years ago, which is called long wall coal mining. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of long wall mining, but it used to be that in western Pennsylvania to dig coal out of the ground you would do something called room and pillar. So these big corporations would come in, folks that own the coal reserves up and down uh, the east coast and through the coal anthracite bituminous regions, that the corporations would come in and their miners employed by the corporation would go in and do room and pillar mining, which means they'd evacuate the coal out and then they'd leave pillars in place to hold the ground up. Because if you don't leave the pillars in place, guess what happens? Houses and roads and streams and rivers and everything else, they just collapse into those holes. About 10 years ago, they came up with a new thing. It's much more efficient in the coal industry. And the coal companies uh, called longwall coal mining, where huge machines actually run under the surface of the ground to harvest the coal. What happens as the machines move through is that they pull the surface support behind the machines as they're moving through. Uh, and something that we use this nice sounding word for called subsidence happens, which is the land behind where the coal machine is running through drops sometimes six to eight feet uh, into the holes. And what happens at that point is that those areas that have been long well mined, they lose their streams and their rivers. They actually crack the limestone when the subsidence occurs. And so where a stream once, run, once ran, nothing does. And in fact, when somebody actually makes a coal company that's repaired the streams or attempt to, they actually come in and caulk them with cement. They caulk the streams to try to keep the leakage from occurring. It's absolutely amazing stuff. You would think that in Pennsylvania, the Department of Environmental Protection, which is our version of the DES in New Hampshire, and I forget what it's called here, DEP, DEP here in Maine. Absolutely excellent. That the Department of Environmental Protection, you would think in Pennsylvania, would say, wow, this is not great because we're losing our streams and rivers and it's damaging everything in western Pennsylvania. We've got to step in and do something about it. Well, it turns out that the Department of Environmental Protection permits it to happen. They write in subsidence into the permits that they issue for the coal companies. They write it in. It's not called permitting for nothing. It permits something to happen. It legalizes something to happen. And guess who wrote the regulations that the DEP operates under? The coal companies. Planning Commission member in Western Pennsylvania, a good friend of ours named Michael Vacca, he likes to use a phrase, he says, coal is king. He says it doesn't matter what the Pennsylvania Constitution says, it doesn't matter what the DEP regulations say, it doesn't matter what state law says about people being protected or local government being able to make their own rules. It doesn't matter because coal is king. I think in some ways water is becoming king in some areas. What did these folks do in western Pennsylvania? They passed an ordinance. But before they passed the ordinance, they went through something that we've referred to as democracy school, which is a three-day training uh, that we run to give people the bad news. And the bad news is that the system of government and structure of law that we think we have in this country really doesn't exist when you actually attempt to use it to protect your community. Because these folks in western Pennsylvania went through the democracy school, didn't like what they heard, and they said, hey, 
we think we have a right to local self-government here in Western Pennsylvania. Structure of law in the last hundred years really belies that fact because as Mari said, believe it or not, the law in the United States today is if something's been deemed to be a legal use, L-E-G-A-L, a legal use, water withdrawals, legal uses, corporate pork production, legal use, uh, low-level radioactive waste uh, disposal, legal use, toxic waste incinerators, legal use, you get the picture. Every, most everything is a legal use because it's permitted by the state. If something's been deemed a legal use, once again, L-E-G-A-L, -E that communities are prohibited from banning it. Okay? Legal use, prohibited from banning it. It's the status of the law. Doesn't matter whether you ask the corporate lawyers, the environmental lawyers, doesn't matter what lawyers you ask on either side of the fence, they'll tell you the same thing. It's been well-settled law for the past hundred years. Legal use, can't ban it. Some people at that point in democracy schools always say, well, that's not true, we have zoning ordinances, and through the zoning ordinances you can ban a certain use. Well, not quite. Under the zoning ordinances, which are land use laws, you can separate out incompatible land uses, like commercial, from industrial, from residential. You attempt to use a zoning ordinance to ban illegal use, you're looking at a big fat lawsuit from the corporation whose rights, under the law, you have just violated. So what did these folks do in Western Pennsylvania? They were looking at the destruction of their township because they're over this big thing called the Buffalo Coal Reserve, which is owned by about five different corporations who can't wait to get their fingers into it. These Blaine Township supervisors, a little place called Blaine Township in Washington County, no more than 500 people living in Blaine, looked at the existing law, looked at the regulatory structure, saw to themselves that the best thing they were going to get out of investing time in the regulatory and permitting structure was things like buffer zones and decibel levels maybe controlled a couple hours a day, but it certainly wasn't going to allow them to say no to coal coming out of the ground. They did it because they had no other choice but to do something different. Because if they had stuck with the same activism, the same stuff that we've been doing for 40 years in this country, to try to stop the bad things from assaulting our community and then cleaning them up afterwards, that they said to themselves, we have to do something different here. They had no other place left to turn. So they came to democracy school. And what they heard in democracy school wasn't us promoting X, Y, and Z. What they heard in democracy school was us talking about history. It's pretty dry to some folks. They always still think democracy school is pretty dry. But we go back to the 1600s. In fact, we go back to 1066. Because what we have in this country is a constitutional structure of law, Mari was talking about, which actually incorporated something called English common law. That's what we used as the platform, the DNA, for our own constitution. And guess what? That law actually places the rights of property and commerce. Keep in mind, water is commerce, uh, mining is commerce, incineration is uh, commerce, garbage is commerce, you name it over the rights of people, communities, and nature. That's DNA'd into the law. That's the structure of law that we have. Okay? It's a lot of stuff and uh, fairly, see somebody's calling us on it already. <laughs> so what happened in Blaine Township and why is it relevant to you folks? Well, they decided to pass an ordinance and their ordinance looks a lot like Barnstead's ordinance. It looks a lot like Nottingham's ordinance. Because, guess what? Because what happens is when we actually try to stand up and say, we don't want that. Our vision of a sustainable community does not include a 15,000 head hog factory farm in the middle of it, or being undermined to the point where we lose all of our streams and rivers in our community. It doesn't include running dry because somebody's coming in to pop and drill our pump, our aquifer. It doesn't include that. Well, it turns out if you want to say no to coal mining, in your community. You don't want to say no to this corporation coming in to rip out the coal. You run into the same structural and legal hurdles that you folks run into when you want to say no to some corporation coming into your community. It's exactly the same because it's a script. In Pennsylvania, we passed a number of years ago something called the Water Resources Management Act which was essentially companies wanting to come into Pennsylvania to pump water and big agribusiness concerns wanting to pump water for these factory farms in mid-state Pennsylvania. What they did was they came in two years before and they wrote a law that essentially was supposed to regulate them, but they were the ones that authored it. 
So that when we want to do something in our community and we're told the best you can do is work within the regulatory system, and we look at that regulatory system, and number one, it doesn't allow us to say no to something coming in, but number two, it wasn't even written by us. It wasn't even written by us. And if we think those boys, the corporate boys, were actually looking out for us when they wrote the regulatory structures underneath which we work, we must be crazy because they wrote it to extract. They wrote it to extract with the least possible interference from the communities in which they're seeking to do business in. 